Hello and welcome back to the floor of ILW2951. My name is Paul Berserker01, Batman Shelley, your humble host and space bartender at the Astro Pub, and your professor at the Museum of Galactic Historian. Today we're talking about Aegis Dynamics, because it is Aegis Dynamics Day on the floor, but as always remember, this is not a comprehensive lore piece on the history of Aegis or any of these ships. It's more of a general overview to help you understand about the ships that you're going to be flying out here during Invictus Launch Week. If you want a more comprehensive look at some of these ships and more of the lore of Star Citizen, up there's a link. That is to uh, our Galactic Historian playlist that has all of the lore pieces that I've done, almost a hundred lore pieces at this point, uh, from uh, dedicated videos to lectures and more. And of course, as always, right up there, you'll see a little link for our Twitch twitch.tv slash the Astro Pub, where we are live Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, talking Star Citizen and other aspects as well. Come join us there at your own leisure. Now, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about Aegis Dynamics. He was formed uh, from a, I'm looking at my notes here, Aegis Macrocomputing and Dynamic Production Systems, two companies which worked together specifically to create Aegis Dynamics, which was designed from its inception to build naval vessels. At its time of its creation, 2532, the UPE was still new, and after con contact with the Jian Empire, the Banu Empire, and many other alien species, as well as a hostile universe, as it will, there was a lack of true dedicated naval vessels that were required for the protection of this new government. As a result, Aegis Dynamics sought to fill that gap, and did they fill that gap? They did. In fact, becoming one of the more iconic uh, ship manufacturers for the first Tavaran War that would happen not, not 10 or so years later. There, they actually helped save the life of one of the most influential members of the First Foreign War of the, of the Army, Ivar Messer, and their close relationship with him would lead them to great success over the entire Messer era of the UEE. Some rocky spot spots afterwards, but they have managed to pull themselves up back to a somewhat competitive stance with the UEE military, as well as some civilian craft, which is a surprising change for a company that was the founded specifically to be a military craft constructor. But I'm getting on a little bit more. Let's start with the ships, with the oldest ship, the youngest, the oldest ship in the Aegis fleet, the Aegis Retaliator. So this is the Retaliator Bomber. Retaliator Bomber specifically is built by, by Aegis Dynamics in 2944, I'm sorry, 2544, yeah, 2544, um, specifically as uh, to fill the role of strategic bomber. There were lots of bombers before this, but this is the first real strategic bomber ever built for humanity's military. They did this by asking a bunch, many bomber pilots at the time what they lacked in their current uh, models and what they would like to see in future models. They took those bucket lists, those wish lists, put them together, and out came the Retaliator Bomber. Its first taste of combat was during the First Tavarn War, where it showed that it was very good at its job, but it really shined during the invasion of Idris the liberation of Idris, which was going pretty badly until Ivar Messer was able to take control of the ground troops and direct round-the-clock retaliator strategic danger-close bombing that really broke the backs of the Tavaran and allowed humanity to retake the Idris system, eventually using the same retaliator bombers for raids into Tavaran's home system, thus bringing an end to the war. The Retaliator Bomber is one of the, if not the thing, that made the Aegis Dynamics brand become so popular with the military. And the saving the life of Ivor Messer would eventually become, lead to a very close relationship, working relationship with Ivor Messer as he became the first Imperator, which meant that Aegis was the company of the UEE. Aegis and the UEE, Aegis and the Messers were one and the same for many people, which would cause problems during the downfall of the Messers. But we're, again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about, for go from the, the oldest Aegis design to one of the newest ones, Aegis Saber. Now, the Aegis Sabre is a very, very old ship, 
though it's new, its roots go run run deep. The Aegis Saber finds its roots back in 2544 or before. Camor de Leon, a close working partner with Ivor Messer and a veteran of the First of Iron War, began to work with Aegis to help develop new fighter craft after the end of the First of Iron War and around the same time as the UEE became the UEE. He specifically worked on a project called the Comet Project, Aegis Comet. Now, the Aegis Comet was not a very good ship in terms of an actual functional combat ship, but a lot of the design aspects of the Comet would then eventually be learned to inherit it into the Gladiator. Now, from the Comet eventually came the Sabre. In the 30th century, the UEE Navy was looking for a new heavy fighter to compete against the Stinger, the, the Vanduul Stinger. And the, the Aegis Dynamics threw the Sabre design in as a contestant for this slot. Now, the thing about this is that the Aegis designed Sabre is very similar to the Comet, the ancient design for the Comet, but modernized and updated. Now, it's still unknown if the Aegis Sabre is, is in fact, in use for the U.S. Mil- uh, the U.S. the UEE military, but uh, it is likely we've seen it in some of the trailers and such, uh, as well as uh, we do. But we do know that the Sabre is very popular with civilian contractors because Aegis did something that only Anvil had done before. The same day that they submitted the Sabre for approval with the UEE Navy, they released it to the public, thus making the public and military versions almost identical. This version of the Sabre is the Sabre Comet, named after the pregenitor of the Sabre itself, uh, and is you where's the the livery of Camor Dalion himself, who would help test pilot the original saber. So this is a not only is the latest ship, but it also kind of is a throwback to the original designs for fighters by Aegis Dynamics. Now let's talk about the Hammerhead, the progeny of Project Monitor. This is the premier patrol ship, frigate, gunship. There's a lot of different names for this. It is designed specifically to uh, take on and intercept fighters and torpedoes that were bound for the main fleet. The Aegis Hammerhead is designed to essentially send up a wall of flak and other uh, projectiles in front of the fleet and intercept large fighter squadrons before they can get into range of the more vulnerable destroyers, carriers, cruisers, and so on. It has done its job very well throughout history, and in fact, multiple hammerheads in the past have managed to team up and take on Vanduul capital ships, things that it's not designed to do. It does a very good job at what it what it's designed to do, but not much else. That is the Hammerhead. It is uh, still being used by the UE military, but it is very, very well liked by many mercenaries who've managed to find some of their these designs uh, from surplus, as the original Hammerhead was built in 2773, towards the end of the, the Bezer era and beginning of the new UE. All right. I, those of you who watch me very closely know that I hate this ship. I hate it to pieces. I think it's a giant piece of garbage. But, in all fairness, I'm going to try to go over the lore as much as possible. This is the Aegis Redeemer. Now, the Redeemer is a more modern ship that was built in the 2940s, specifically for the role of a gunship, a dropship gunship hybrid with some seats, but mostly to fill the role of a gunship to support the Anvil Valkyrie. And the Aegis Redeemer is probably the most unique ship in the Aegis lineup simply for its engines. This hybrid experimental design is designed to tilt forward and back and to give the gunship as much uh, 
lift in atmosphere as in space and to give it a lot more maneuverability without having to sacrifice a bunch of weak points like maneuvering thrusters. Still has some maneuvering thrusters, but the, the design is to heavily rely on these engines to help it maneuver. Gives it a bigger target and more points, points of... Uh, the, I'm not going to go on about the, this too much because I don't really like, like the design myself. But it is definitely a gunship. It has lots and lots of guns and can be utilized both in space and on ground very effectively. It's very good at its role in terms of defending ground troops and protecting dropships from aerial assaults. In fact, is sort of a replacement for the Vanguard series, though we still haven't really seen how well it would replace the Vanguard series when we talk about the Vanguards further on down the line. So with that, let's go on to the Fighters of Aegis Dynamics. All right, here we are in the small fighter wing of Aegis Dynamics. We're going to start from the left, talking about the Aegis Avenger. Now, the Avenger is a carrier-based medium fighter. It was built specifically to be a carrier-based medium fighter. And there are some interesting aspects of the, the Avenger. It is designed to be aer aerodynamic and have some flexible loadouts, but it also has a large area at its rear to fill for some, to fill a uh, flexible additions to create, to allow the Avenger to become more than just a pure fighter. Now, it did its job pretty well, but it was definitely outclassed by the much better Anvil Hornet. The F-7A Hornet. But it didn't go away in military service. In fact, it just sort of transitioned from military to civilian and police services as the advocacy was very keen on getting their own Avengers. Actually, let me go off, off of the, uh, the original introduction. Like many of the later Mezzer era ships, the Mezzer era ending in 2792, this was introduced in 2760 and it was sort of a, a response to the Van Duel. Like the Hammerhead, like the uh, Vanguard that we'll talk about in the future, these later era uh, Mezzer ships, Mezzer Aegis ships, are kind of a transition point from the old Aegis designs to the mid 28th, 29th century designs, then, then lead into the modern designs, like the Sabre. As a result, there's a lot of flexibility built into the Avenger, which is, again, very, very similar to most of the late Mezzer era designs, something that is designed to be more flexible and do multiple roles. Because of that, once the Avenger was replaced by the F-7A, many advocacy pilots and agents began to use them f exclusively for their police work. This in front of me is the Anvil, I'm sorry, Anvil, Aegis Renegade, um, Titan Renegade. This livery and loadout is specifically chosen because of its choice by agent Danny Solomon. Now, Danny Solomon was a agent in the Bremen system um, and during the mid-29th century, so mid-2800s. He became known for his ruthless, very bloodthirsty way of applying law enforcement. He, it was said that he chose the Renegade, I'm sorry, the Titan variant, because he didn't need to bring back suspects. He just needed to bring back bodies. The Titan itself swaps out the back area, which usually has holding cells, like in the stalker over here, with just a cargo bay. As you can see here, there's nothing back here. Now, this meant that many outlaws in the Bremen system feared Agent Solomon for his tenacity and his, for his ruthlessness. And many would surrender to him without a fight because of this, because they would rather not be killed by him. Now, this is actually a myth. Solomon chose the Titan not because he was some bloodthirsty agent out for revenge, but because it didn't need him. He didn't need the, the stalker cryopods because he had one of the best militias in the entire UVE with the Bremen Defense Force. 
Now, the thing about the Outlaws of the Bremen system is that they've been active, active throughout the Mezer era and some, some, sometimes before the Mezer era, I think. I don't remember exactly when Bremen got in there. But it's always been a hotbed of outlaw and rebel activity. Bremen's always been kind of the fringe system that's never really fit in the UEE, though it's always very important to the UEE, so they kind of have this love-hate relationship, similar to Terra, though it's a lot more independent for the people of Bre Bremen. As a result, the outlaws knew how to get around security systems and been dealing with the UEE advocacy and other security forces for their entire lives. So Solomon did everything he could to get an edge on these outlaws, including lighten his ship so that he could catch them better, thus the Titan, which is not as heavy as the, as the Stalker is. Then relying on the Bremen Defense Force to actually apprehend the suspects or, you know, keep them into custody and bring them back for trial. But as a result, he became known as the Renegade. And this version is part of the Masters of Flight series. And it's, you could purchase it. It has the loadout that's similar to Agent Solomon's uh, choice and a livery similar to what he would have had during his occupation or during his time as a UEE advocacy agent. Then over here, we have the Stalker. Now, the Stalker variant is similar to the Titan. Uh, they're all very similar in the sense they have pretty much the same hard points. The major uh, difference is the back area. Whereas the Titan has just cargo, the Stalker has six cryopods for apprehending suspects and keeping them, bringing them into, into, uh, into, well, bring them in justice, to justice. <laughs> um, and, uh, I will say another point of the Avenger, the reason why it's so popular with advocacy agents, is that it has its own bunk. So you could sleep in and operate in long hours with a Avenger, which is different from almost any other fighter. It's one of the few fighters that, that has a bunk. Then over here, we're going to skip the Eclipse for now, is the Warlock. Now, the Warlock is something that you would not see a solo advocacy, advocacy agent using. Typically, they will usually be used with multiple advocacy, advocacy agents at the same time. The reason why is that the Warlock swaps the back wheel out for an EMP generator, a very powerful EMP generator, one of the most powerful EMP generators in the game today. So, an advocacy agent would fly the Warlock, disable an enemy, and then the other agents would float, swoop in and then apprehend the suspects if need be. So that's the Warlock. From the Warlock, let's go to one of the most shameful ships in the Aegis Dynamics fleet, which is pretty, pretty saying a lot since they've supported the Mezzers. Um, this is the, Anv the Aegis Dynamics Eclipse. This is a stealth bomber. It was built under the em Imperator Coley after the Mezzer era, specifically with the Xi'an in mind. This is designed to sneak up on Xi'an capital ships, launch their torpedoes, and disappear before they could be even noticed, or before they, they're, by the time they're noticed, it's too late, kind of thing. And it, it had a long, difficult development, uh, and because the Xi'an threat was becoming less and less, and the Xi'an were becoming more amicable with humanity, the need for a stealth fighter to attack the Xi'an became non-existent. However, in the 29, in 2930, this ship was used against Vanduul threats to great effect, uh, making it somewhat still effective. Though it's still, because of its original design, it doesn't really meet its purpose. But it still is a decent stealth bomber if you need to hit something without them seeing you. Lastly, one of the iconic ships of the UEE fleet, possibly one of the most iconic Aegis ships ever, the Aegis Dynamics Gladius. Now, the Gladius has an interesting history. The Gladius comes from an older fighter called the Stiletto. Now, its origins come from the Stiletto specifically because of a single event, the fall of the Olympus. The battle carrier Olympus was chasing down outlaws between the First and Second Tavarn War in the Null system. And the Olympus got too close to one of the planets and got caught by the atmosphere in pursuit of these outlaws and crashed into the planet. 
Now, as the members of the Olympus were scrambling to get to escape pods and to get to ships to get off of the doomed ship, the only thing that could protect them was its combat air patrol, which was a group of stiletto fighters. This last stand of the Olympus by the, by the combat air patrol became legendary as the fighters fought to the last man to protect their brothers and sisters in the Olympus, getting them to safety. The black box recording was sold back to the UE, and instead of hiding this, they used this as a propaganda campaign, saying that, look at these brave men and women who stood to their last ground to help their, to help their fellow starmen to survive. Beautiful story. It also showed that the stilettos were very powerful as defense fighters. They could do very good jobs, um, whereas before, in the first of Iron War, they were not seen as really much of anything. They were seen more of as a escort or picket ships. They, they were very rarely used uh, compared to the medium and heavy fighters that humanity more, more relied on against the Tavarin. So... The Gladius itself became the replacement for the stiletto after this big event had happened, after it became popularized. Aegis took everything they learned from the Comet, the failed Comet program, to develop the Gladius. Now, again, still, the UE Navy didn't really trust the Gladius, but the old stiletto pilots and the new 36th Fighter Squadron, which specifically was given the Gladius, decided that they were going to do everything they can to learn how to fight with light fighters, developing new strategies and tactics to help them improve their chances. When the Second Devarn War broke out, the 36th was broken up against uh, from many different carrier fleets, and they hold the distinction that their carriers that they were assigned to protect, not a single one of those carriers ever in, uh, had a torpedo impact them during the Second of Iron War. They shot down every single or piece of ordnance that was fired at their carriers. That's how good they were. Now, they didn't, other than that, there wasn't much fanfare for the 36th until the Vanduul showed up. Now, the Vanduul began to invade uh, Orion um, few, many years after the Second of Iron War. And one individual in, per, in particular... Uh, by the way, Gladius was first introduced in 2579. Let's just get into that in there. Uh, one p individual in particular... Condi Hillard found one of these in 2677. It was an old, scrapped Gladius in a junkyard. She bought the scrap truck Gladius, rebuilt it herself, and in a bid to become a mercenary herself. She joined the Orion Defense Protection, which is a private mercenary group based out of, out of Orion. There, while the, after the first Vanduul attack happened in Orion, they were hired to protect some settlements on the outskirts of the system. Her and a flight of other ships were on patrol, and when they were coming back from patrol one day, they saw two Vanduul scythes going in for an attack on their base. The Vanduul scythes didn't see them. They ambushed those scythes, and she managed to kill one of the scythes, making that her the first person to kill a scythe, and the Gladius the first ship to ever kill a Vanduul ship that's on record. This ship right here is, it's not that ship, but it was made with the same livery. That's the um, Orion Defense Protection right there. Uh, this is the v uh, Vanguard Valiant, which is, again, similar to the Titan Renegade over there, the, a part of the Masters of Flight series. This is sort of an homage to historical fighter pilots who have, or historical pilots who have done a lot for the Empire. So this is her loadout and her livery for the Gladius. Now, the 36th would later be assigned to Orion to try to do, defend it against the <clears throat> Vanduul. And they managed to do it very well, developing new tactics and write, literally writing the book on how to dogfight with the Vanduul Scythes and Glaives, thus uh, becoming the first and best fighter squadron to fight the Vanduul. Since then, they have no longer used the Gladiuses. They've been phased out of the Gladiuses and into the F-8s, as they are, I guess, a Vanduul fighting squadron. That's why they're going from a light to a heavy, but it's kind of weird. But, you know, hey, that's it. And the Gladiuses are being phased out of service in the UE Navy. 
Thus, there's a lar large scramble for people to buy surplus uh, gladiuses to use them in their own militaries, or their own private militaries, their own private military corporations. So, that's a gladius. All right, let's move on to talk about the vanguards, the pride and premier choice of the UEE Marines. All right, here we go. The vanguard wing of the Aegis Dynamics show for here for Invictus Launch Week 2951. Now, here in the center is the Vanguard Warden. The Vanguard series was first built in 2737. And like I said, many of the 28th century ships built by Aegis Dynamics are built around modularity, uh, to a tool to fit with, with what they need. What made the Avenger very popular is the same reason why the Vanguard is very popular. Now, specifically, the Vanguard is popular with the Marines. The Warden, which is the base variant, was built as a long-range patrol and escort vessel designed to escort larger ships, convoys and such, without the need of protection from and support from naval carriers. As a result, the Vanguard can operate on very distant patrols and very distant, distant locations without much support, which is perfect for the Marines who often have to operate without close air support or any close support for logistics for long periods of time. Thus, the Vanguard has become very popular with them. Second, as well, is the Battlefield Upgrade Kits. The BUKs, if you look here, see these straps here, keep doors clear when operational. These are a modular bay that can be swapped out for other add-ons. The Warden is designed to have long-range habitability in mind, so this middle section is more designed as an, a lifeboat as well as a, a long, you know, various different accoutrements to keep the crews, crews awake and happy for long periods of time. But, because you could swap out the middle, there is multiple variants of the Vanguard. The Harbinger, the Hoplite, and the Sentinel. This is the Harbinger. The Harbinger is a middle section which is uh, holds size 5 torpedoes making it very good against larger ships and harder targets as a bomber as a uh, fighter bomber even the top turret up here is swapped out for uh, missiles for for rocket pods to give it a little bit more of an oomph in combat over here we have the hoplite which swaps out the back area for a troop transport holding up to six uh six troops and their gear to allow for the Vanguard to become a dropship, if need be, as well as the upper upper areas given more of a ballistic loadout, but not as unique as the Harbinger. Lastly, we have the Sentinel, which is a e-warfare variant of the Vanguard, designed to knock out communications and other sensors and other other things for to allow for forces to infiltrate into system now the main reason as i kind of talked about this this modularity design one of the reasons why the ue marines really like to use the vanguards is because they will use vanguards as its own self-contained fleet the harbingers as long-range fighter escorts the i'm sorry the wardens as long-range fighters escorts the harbingers as bombers the hoplites as troop transports and the Sentinels as E-Warfare Wild Weasel. A typical Marine engagement will include a few Sentinels going out ahead of the rest of the Vanguards to disable the radar, LIDAR, any sensor technology, as well as any communications in the region to create a blackout area for their forces to infiltrate. The Harbingers and Wardens would then go in uh, the Wardens in support of the Harbingers. The Harbingers would then hit any hard targets need to, that, that needs to happen while the Hoplites would then land the troops, drop them off the location to take whatever target they need to, while the Harbingers, Wardens, and Sentinels would then act as close air support to protect them from enemy uh, air forces and ground forces. Once everything is done, the mission is complete, they could load back up into the Hoplites, get back out, and get away, sometimes before the enemy even knew they were there allowing them a flexibility of a fleet with almost all of the tools needed without as much logistical support required. 
So that's the Vanguard. These are the the long range fighters, long range support craft of the UE Navy and the Marine Corps, the pride of the UE Marines. With that, let's go on to the holographic room where we can find some ships which are in active duty, but not quite in the game yet. So we can learn a little bit more about them. Moving off to the right here. Now this ship first introduced in the, solidly in the Mesa era. I don't have the dates on, on top of me. Is the Aegis Vulcan. Oh, this is the name. The drone ship of the UEE. Now the Vulcan is important because as the Empire was expanding after the Second Tavar, First and Second Tavar War, one of the major problems that arose is infrastructure. There was not a lot of infrastructure in a lot of these new locations where humanity was trying to set up colonies and just set up a presence. And because it takes a long time to build infrastructure, they were often converting, you know, civilians and the military were often converting non ships that were not designed for the role to work as fuel haulers or repair vehicles. So to meet this problem, Aegis designed the Vulcan, which was designed essentially as a platform for drones to do the job for them. They could slip whatever drones they needed to to do the right jobs. Now, specifically with the Vulcan, it's designed to, be, to work with the Bard drones, which can carry either fuel, ammo, both, or even repair various vessels. The idea behind the Vulcan was you had a fleet of these which would each be set aside for a single thing. One repair, one refuel, one rearm. They would go in with a uh, second wave with an initial assault, and then they would f the other ships would fall back once they got damaged or need to refuel or rearm. The Vulcans would be able to repair, refuel, rearm them in the field, get them back out into the fight, into the fight and they'd still be protected. So the Vulcan was so popular in the military, even while it was being developed, that the same problems that encountered with the military in terms of infrastructure is, was doubly impacted with the, the civilian market. So the space triple A of the, of the verse uh, specifically required uh, to buy Vulcans from Aegis, which was the first time this had ever happened where a civilian was asking to buy military hardware from Aegis. So they had to get approval from the Mezer Empire, from the Mezer government, who surprisingly accepted this. So the one of the very first military conversions from military to civilian uh, ships from the Aegis fleet was in fact the Vulcan, which is still being used today even by private contractors as a logistics support craft. Then we go here. The secret submarine, <laughs> the secret space submarine of the UEE. First built in 2549, similar to, uh, well, this is kind of the early Aegis design ma uh, manifesto, was to talk with the pilots who currently use whatever craft they're building, ask for their bucket list, and then build their bucket list. The Nautilus is the bucket list for mine layers. The First Divine War required a conversion of civilian craft into military mine layers, and it wasn't great. It didn't work very well. But mines became a very important aspect of warfare in the First Divine War. So the UEE wanted a bespoke mine layer, a mine layer that could work for their own purposes. So Aegis was tasked of designing and building these. They went out, asked what they wanted. They built a mine layer, the Nautilus. The Nautilus is incredibly important in history because it is over 400 years old. And as a result, it has fought in pretty much every engagement in UEE history without many people knowing it. Its first engagement was in the Second Tavaran War, and its probably most infamous engagement in the Second Tavaran War was the Battle of Centauri, where they mined the entrance where the Tavaran fleet was coming from uh, to help guide the Devarn fleet to force them to fight at uh, a location where the UE was a little bit more advantageous for them. In fact, Squadron 42 gets the glory for it, but if it wasn't for the Nautilus squadrons dropping those mines, Squadron 42 may have not even engaged the Tavarn fleet as uh, the way that they wanted to, so helped secure victory for the UE. No one knew about it. Now, the most recent engagement of the Nautilus was, in fact, the Battle of Oberon, Wait, let me look at the actual name of it. It was called the Hellkite Run. 
Now, a Hellkite run is a maneuver that Nautiluses do where they essentially spike the backfield of a uh, enemy's lines with mines to catch them unawares if they're trying to retreat. Aegis Nautilus pilots or Aegis Nautilus squadrons drop their mines behind the lines at the Battle of Oberon to catch the fleeing Vanduul. It worked really well, destroying many of the fleeing Vanduul ships. It was, it was, the Battle of Oberon wasn't a, by any means, a one-sided victory, but because of the Nautilus, it became a rout that destroyed the invading Vanduul clan, decimating it, leaving it very, very few ships remaining because of this Hellkite run. So, as a result, the Nautilus remains a very key aspect of the UEE Navy, but it is also available for civilian sales for the first time ever. A lot of these, these, when it became available for the civilian market, a lot of these stories first came out to the public. So it's pretty cool to have this here. You'll be seeing this here shortly as well. And that's it for Aegis Day here at Invictus Launch Week 2951. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please do subscribe to us. We are hitting that, trying to hit that 10K subscriber goals. Um, I... It doesn't really mean much, but I'm, I have an eight brain and number go up is good. <laughs> so please number go up. Good. Make me feel good. Uh, like the, the video comment down below. Those both help get to tell YouTube that this is, this is good. This is this. People want to see this, uh, you know, let me know. Do you like Aegis? Do you, are you an Aegis fanboy? What ships are your favorite Aegis ships? How about their relationship with the Messers? Any of this and more, ask it down below. I'll do my best to answer it. And as always, remember Exastoria and Astra.